Hi, thank you so much for joining us this morning. It's really nice to see you all um, out on this breezy Sunday morning. Um, thank you for joining us for this conversation about the relationship between creative documentary and journalism. Um, it's great to be joined by some fabulous panelists whose work I um, admire and I'm and, um, inspired by, as well as Charlotte, who's on the screen, beaming in from the world. Hi. Yeah. <laughs> Charlotte's back there. We can all turn around. There's a, there's a little camera back there. We can all turn and wave to Charlotte right now. Yay. <laughs> um, some housekeeping first. We have uh, just over an hour in this room here. So um, as well as hearing from our panelists, we have a few clips to show you. And it'd be really great to have your questions. So if anyone has anything they want to contribute or to ask, please pop your hand up. And we'll walk around with some microphones towards the end of um, towards the end of this conversation. Um, but first, maybe we can go around and introduce ourselves so you have a bit of a sense of our kind of perspective on this conversation. Um, Charlotte, do you wanna go first? Hi, everyone. Sorry my face is so enormous. It's, I can see it as well, which makes it even more unsettling. <laughs> um, and sorry I'm not with you all, but I didn't want to miss this panel because I thought it was such a good idea and a very important thing to talk about. So um, my name's Charlotte, I'm from Field of Vision. And Field of Vision um, is an organization that funds and distributes short um, and feature films. In fact, we can do any length of film and we can come in at any stage. And from the beginning, uh, Field of Vision's kind of ethos has been to show different perspectives on the world. So craft and creativity has been very much at the forefront of what we've always done. So I was very excited to have this panel, especially with the context of journalism, because our shorts sit in that space too. So this is my favorite thing to talk about. So thank you for having me. Um, Cherish. Uh, yeah, my name is Cherish. I'm a producer, director, and uh, made the black hop for The Guardian. Yvonne. I'm Yvonne. I work with um, Opdocs, the short documentary series of the New York Times, as a series producer. And um, we mostly do acquisitions, but we can come in at the rough cut stage. And we've been a series for over 10 years. Last year was our 10 year anniversary. And we program films on a rolling basis. So, yeah. My name's Emma Davey, and uh, I directed a film called The All Machine, which just opened yesterday, very much looking at how embedded we are in the world of oil, and specifically looking at North Sea oil and the complexities of getting off it. Um, and I mentioned my name's Lindsay. I'm head of documentaries at The Guardian, so my role is around commissioning and curating um, independent creative documentaries to sit on our platforms alongside all the journalism that we do at The Guardian. So I'm thinking a lot about this conversation and this tension and the shared values that um, uh, creative documentary and journalism have in common. Um, uh, yes, I can I start by showing you a little bit of a clip just to get us sort of in the mood. It's a short, <laughs> um, a short reel from what we've been doing at The Guardian. Should we play that little clip now? Super tiny, <laughs> um, but it's nice to sort of indicate to some of the creative approaches that independent filmmakers take to storytelling, which really sort of inspires me and, um, and what I'm interested in doing to sort of complement the work that our journalists do. Um, we saw a little um, glimpse in there of The Black Cop, the film that you made. I wondered if you could like begin by talking to us about you know, the genesis of the project and how you, uh, or why I guess you thought that it would be good to collaborate with The Guardian on it. Mm. Um, yeah, the film was very much an extension of a friendship um, that I formed with the lead uh, contributor. Um, and yeah, I connected with him because at that time I was trying to connect with older black LGBTQ plus people and we kind of built a friendship and he shared some of the difficult parts of his journey towards kind of self-acceptance and he was really keen on sharing his story. Um, and I knew it was an important story to, to tell and one that um, people could connect to the universal themes on. Um, so yeah, that's kind of the genesis of the story. I think because um, for people who haven't seen The Black Cop, it meditates on a former police officer's experience of being both the perpetrator and victim of racism within the police force, um, and he is a black man so, and a gay man, so it um, looks at it through that lens. Um, and yeah, I thought The Guardian was an important platform to work with on that, just because, you know, from the perspective of a black person, when we're dealing with racism on a day-to-day, -day, it's so, um, intangible in many ways. You're not told, I'm treating you like this because you're black, but you feel it and you understand the, the subtext 
Um, and, you know, for a certain section of society, they look to discredit that because you can't prove it. And I think having a film like this on The Guardian gives it a level of validation for people who need that validation. Um, and for me, it was about adding to the conversation. Um, there was a lot that was being kind of made and said about race, racism, and the fraught relationship between the police and the black community. And I wanted to kind of bring in um, an element to the conversation that I hadn't really seen before. Um, and someone speaking about the more like emotional impacts of racism and how it can change how you see yourself and your community and how that can be enacted. Um, and so, yeah, it was a great kind of marriage of, I approached it as a creative um, filmmaker, but mm. I think The Guardian was a good place to kind of have that conversation and add to the conversation. Mm. And I know like when you um, proposed the project, like in, in sort of development as a paper treatment, I was really interested in some of the themes that it touches on because, you know, we had done a lot of reporting around, um, you know, abuses of power in, in the Met and, uh, and some of the issues that you describe around, you know, themes around LGBTQ, um, uh, the push for equality. So these are editorially relevant themes, but I think that looking for, you know, your creative treatment of that and also the unique relationship and position that you had in relation to this um, and the relationship of trust that you had with G to sort of tell those stories, I thought like complemented um, the journalism. And I know you're thinking a lot about that, Yvonne, as well, aren't you? Like how the creative documentaries sit in relation to New York Times journalism. Did you want to talk a bit about that? Yeah. Short documentary series that sits within the opinion section of the New York Times. So, you know, you have the opinion section in the newsroom. And what we think about a lot is how filmmaking, how films can kind of go beyond the headlines and offer our audience something that an article can't and a podcast can't. But at the same time, it's like, well, what can, you know, the journalism, the articles, the reporting, the podcast, the whatnot can do what film can't? Because our, our audience, in a way, they engage with our work in the context of the New York Times brand, right? Like people come to the New York Times, the homepage, they'll read the articles, they may listen to the daily, they may watch an op-doc. And within that, you know, we, we're thinking a lot of like, okay, what, like in thinking about like editorial, for us it's kind of like, well, what can a film do in the sense of if something is happening in the news or not happening in the news, but still is something relevant, what can a film do to kind of, you know, give it a human story? What kind of, you know, character-driven story can do something that then, challenges what people's perception of you know whatever the topic may be or may also refresh their idea of like this is something i've read about this is something i've engaged about but this particular filmmaker's style approach you know it's like however they work with the film can kind of do that and i think also because opdoc sits within the opinion section that's a section of the new york times where it's like you know you have the columnists and you have guest contributors so people are very primed to the fact that these are films from our end that are made by independent contributors and that people are really responsive to the fact that, you know, if the filmmaker can, you know, and for us too, you know, the Times of course is based in America, but it's a global paper, it's around the world. So Opdocs is a global, we, we distribute films globally. We don't, you know, geoblock anything. So that also means that the films we program, you know, aren't only in English, we program, you know, I say sometimes, you know, I, I would maybe estimate that like, our international films, depending on the time of year, maybe 50 or 65% of our films are international. So it's like for us to, you know, I try to tell filmmakers that even if you may think that your film may not be understand by an American audience or an audience that may not, you know, be from your country or be from your, where, from, where you're from, I think there is also like a, there's a very kind of, not easy way, but there's kind of like a very creative way in which you can introduce someone to a short, to a short form story very quickly so that they get enough context they need to open themselves up to the story that you're telling. Mm. It's really interesting to hear about the relationship to the like edit other editorial parts of the paper and also this like I've always been really um, like interested in your commissioning and how it like provokes conversation around subjects. I think that's really like yeah really important and interesting. Um, your film is sort of wanting to provoke a conversation, isn't it? And it was, um, I mean, maybe you can introduce uh, the film and talk a bit about how it came up, but I was quite interested um, because I knew about it a bit because of Terry and James's book, which I know partly inspired the film. So did you want to talk a bit about it? Sure, maybe, maybe Terry and James should, should show the book because there's a, a <laughs> the film very much came about from um, <laughs> product placement. <laughs> 
So Terry McAllister and James Marriott had written a book called Crude Britannia, and um, in fact, it wasn't finished when James, who's a, an old pal of mine, old as a long-term friend, as opposed <laughs> to an old bloke, uh, <laughs> we, um, we, we, we had been discussing the possibility of some kind of collaboration, and James said, why don't you make a film of Crude Britannia, which is a book that very much looks at Britain's engagement with oil in many different ways through interviewing many different many different people involved in the oil industry and I immediately said absolutely no way James that's impossible I wouldn't want to do so, such a film anyway um, but there does seem to be something in the collaboration and the, the, the work that James did was very much um, you know I think underneath it was the bedrock of Terry McAllister's journalism looking at oil and James's skill as a writer, bringing that out. Um, I came in as a filmmaker looking at the theme of oil in a very different way and began to try to think, well, what would be a way of actually limiting this to make it something that we can grasp as an audience and imagine our own implications in a bit more? And also, what would be something that is currently urgent to look at? And it felt gradually that looking specifically just at North Sea oil was a good way to go. So it feels like almost the filmmaker's mind is trying to distill, put limits, trying to look at something that we can in a way have some kind of emotional relationship with that's more tangible. And I'm always interested in how, how we, we've been talking about the whole question of embodiment, how we embody ideas and how we, how we make them, um, how we flesh them out so that we can see them. And one of the things that's so impossibly difficult about making anything about the oil industry is that it's invisible and they've kept it that way so that the heads of oil the people that run it are largely not present on our screens that the actual methods of production are not present and also the, met the, the ownership of um, what surrounds our seas is also not something that we know about so in a way it felt like the job of the film was to make the invisible visible somehow through some kind of imaginative means which was quite honestly quite challenging and and um, one of the things that James and I talked about a lot was the the relationship between finance and oil and how we could bring that out more and um, so basically, we decided to, to interview, or you know, it felt important, and Sonia, the producer, and the whole team came on board very much to try to, to, to find out what the connections were between the different, different elements of our society which are involved in oil, ranging from somebody working in BP in the North Sea to somebody who's a climate striker, who's 14 years old to somebody who works in finance in London. So we, we tried to work out how, how those connections maybe might give the story. So the story exists actually in the connections, not in any one individual perspective. I hope that makes sense. I mean, I think it, it, is, it is an immensely complex subject that we have to engage with. And it felt like film has a responsibility to make it an emotional engagement. So that's what I'm interested in. I think the thing that you say about like distilling a huge body of work, and full disclosure, I know Terry well from his many years as energy editor at The Guardian. And the, I think this thing about distilling that huge body of knowledge and all the, the work that went into the book and being inspired by that and, and rendering this invisible thing visible, I thought that was really, and it's worth saying as well, the film I saw it last night on the big screen, which is very nice and it's playing at the festival, so do look out for the oil machine um, in your programs. Um, Charlotte, uh, I mean, I'm so inspired by the work that you are doing there, working across all different sorts of, um, of films and having real, uh, like really pushing the boundaries of nonfiction storytelling. I wondered if you wanted to talk a little bit about like this, you know, your sort of guiding principles or, or how you approach such a broad sort of um, spectrum of, of documentary work. Yeah, I mean, I think, I think it, thank you very much, first of all, but I can take no credit because really the secret source to field division is just the filmmakers, truly. Um, you know, they guide us rather than the other way around. Um, and I think 
just because I think perhaps our process and people just know how we work a little bit and that we're very open to like kind of the more experimental or weird side of documentary I think people come to us for that which I really appreciate and so you know and it, it and there's a part of that that isn't just artistic right there's a political element to that too and a lot of the very creative work we do is very very political which I do think can scare other people off and you know we're we're kind of in an independent space so that's the joy we have of doing that um so yeah I think it's it, it is very broad which is a very you know it's an interesting thing to try and always keep a sense of the curation of it because I do feel like we are highly curated as well um but really it is the filmmakers who lead us and I think in you know it's been so interesting hearing what everyone else says because I, I agree with all of it so much and I think for me it's just filmmakers find a way to come out stories that that spin them in a way that it kind of makes you sit back um and I think we need that right now I think there's it's hard not to feel apathy when we're just bombarded all the time with terrible awful things and I think artistic perspectives are really what breaks through that a lot of the time and shows us things from a different lens and makes us really kind of pay attention um so yeah I think that's that's my big answer is just the filmmakers just know how to do it and god they're amazing yeah um thank you for that I think that like it's really interesting having you guys all together having these conversations you know like art but in relation to journalism curating kind of conversations um supporting the community to push the boundaries and like challenge dominant narratives um, and translate the work that journalism journalists do all around the world into um into films that move people and activate them um so it feels like we're all we have these like common values and we're all kind of trying to do the same thing right <laughs> but in different ways of trying to like engage people with this world that we live in and motivate people to sort of um to engage with that and challenge and challenge that there's this thing about form i think is really interesting because like the, you host a lot of different forms of films on your platform from animation to like verite films very authored films, essayed films, and, and same Charlotte with, with Field Division. Can you talk a little bit about your thinking about form, Yvonne? Yeah, I mean, I, I think in thinking about form, I think for us, actually, as it relates to journalism, I think when we were talking earlier, there's a film that we programmed um, in 2020 that I think perfectly fits into the subject of this session called A Ship from Guantanamo. So that film, um, so if you can look it up later, but in that film, it's about one of the first um, people who was, you know, who's been in Guantanamo since his opening. So he's unable to be seen and he's unable to be heard. So when you're talking about making the invisible visible, that really made me think about that film because of the fact that you can't see this man, but you, can hear, you can't hear this man. How do you make a documentary about this man? So those filmmakers are working closely with his lawyers to, you know, get him to, you know, write about, you know, his experiences and the fact that because he's been in Guantanamo for so long and a part of his process of living being imprisoned is making art. So part of that film, you see his art, you see the ships that he's built over over years, you know, using material that he's found in the prison. But you know, the film begins and you and you hear a voice that says, This isn't my hands, this isn't my voice, because he's in prison. So I think in that sense of thinking about form and being creative, I think you know those filmmakers were ingenious in thinking about how do you document someone that can't be documented. You, you know, you think creatively about the form and that's something that like Charlotte is saying that, you know, we look to the filmmakers to, you know, be really like inventive and creative with the form that they want to tell their story. And for us, all the most important thing is that it's grounded in truth. You know, like it's like the form can be animated. You know, we've had a couple, we had films that have been hybrid films, like you said, verite films, essay films. For us, the more expansive, innovative the form is, the more interesting. But at the end of the day, as long as the, as long as that form is showcasing the truth, <laughs> then that's what we want from filmmakers. And you know, fact checking is just an, a huge process for us. You know, we we fact check like every single line of a film that we program. We fact check, and filmmakers are kind of like, oh, like you really want to know that if this happened or if this person exists. And it's like, oh yeah, <laughs> we need also we need to know because you know, rightfully so, people are empowered. You know, to email the New York Times if you like find something. If you want to, you know, issue a correction, you're empowered to do that as a reader, as an audience. And so for us. Also, film is no different in the New York Times where you know, it has to be factual, has to be true. And if it is something that's hybrid or is, is there something that's fictionalized in the film, that's something that you know, my team, we talk about sometimes about like, you may, filmmakers may wanna like wish away an inconvenient truth, but you have to embrace it. If something may be inconvenient in your film, factually or truthfully, it's better to embrace it than be like, oh, we kind of 
fudge this or did that, that didn't happen the way it did. If it didn't happen the way you wanted to, there are you know, inventive, creative ways to kind of not work around it, but embrace the fact. Embrace the fact, I guess. <laughs> That's how to, to end it on that, yeah, embrace the fact. Yeah, I think this thing about like um, being grounded in truth and everything being sort of grounded in truth is really interesting. Um, Charlotte, shall we just show a little, I love the reel that you have from Field of Vision. I think it gives a really nice insight into the breadth of that work that's all sort of founded in truth. Shall we play the Field of Vision? Amazing body of work. I mean, but like so many, like you say, you're you know, responding to this, like, you know, this creative world of filmmakers out there who are, you know, are offering their perspectives on, on some of the biggest, you know, stories that we're facing right now. How do you go about engaging with that? How do you make selections? How do you deci make decisions? What do you look for? Charlotte. <laughs> oh, is Charlotte frozen? Oh, sorry, I had a glitch, but. I got, I got that. Can you hear me okay? Yeah, I can hear you great. Okay. Um, I think, you know, it's, it's a mixture of two things. It's one, what the filmmakers obviously are pitching us, but then it's what we kind of feel like we haven't talked about or desperately want to say. And I think, you know, I'm sure for all of us, it's hard not to see like what's happened this week and just kind of think, my God, we need to talk about this in a bigger way than we have been. So I think there's there's parts of that. It's, it's seeing what's happening in the world. It's kind of paying attention and thinking, how do we try and talk about this? How do we keep trying to talk about this? And, and also then pairing like who would tell this story in a really different, interesting way. Um, so there, it, kind of, it kind of comes from filmmakers directly. We, we have open submissions, but then also we reach out to people and say, we love your perspective on this and kind of set them going. Um, so yeah, it, but it is hard, right? It's, there's so many things to talk about. Um, and also we try not to be like too jumping in a reaction. We were trying to kind of think about stuff. It took us a, a real while to think about like what we would say about the pandemic. Um, and we largely very much landed on wanting to talk about incarceration around the pandemic. Um, that was really our angle on it. So we, we kind of, it's difficult because you know I'm sure as we all know, um, these films take a while. So it is hard to kind of marry that reactive journalism and then also want to have context and build a film around it. So I think for us, it's always about having that extra layer to a story that makes it timeless and also timely because these films come out at different times. Um, so yeah, it's a mixture of all, of all of the above, I think. It's really interesting, this timeliness and being able to like engage with conversations that are ongoing um, or that people are seeing in the news. Or I know like with what I'm thinking about a lot with commissioning for our platforms is like we do reactive news and there is like a way to do that and be part of that conversation but what can what is the perspective that creative documentaries do to complement it so I sort of think of what we're doing at the Guardian in docs is not being on the news agenda but being like aligned to it a companion to it I'm really interested in how films can kind of take us into the lives of people or sort of and go beyond the headlines in that sense um, I'd love to talk more about your film. I know you said you sort of like um, resisted it for a while <laughs> and didn't want to make this film, but what do you look for like in projects? When do you decide, okay, that is a film that I'm going to do? And then how do you realize that? And should we show a clip of the film too? I know we have one. Should we begin with the clip? Yeah. Should we do that? We've got a Give me time to think yeah, about it. We've, <laughs> we've got a reel for the oil machine. Yeah, I think, I think the last statement says it all, really, doesn't it? Mm -hmm. What a responsibility we all have. Um, and I take that very much to heart as a filmmaker, and I feel we all do in our different ways, no matter what work we do. So what, what does that responsibility mean as a creative person? And I guess I feel it's a, it's a huge challenge for us as a filmmaking community to try and find an articulation of the immensity of the challenge that we're facing. And um, not to be daunted by that feels like part of that responsibility. And I think what allowed me not to be daunted was when I met um, Holly, the young then 14 year old activist. And I thought, God, if a 14 year old is doing this, get your act together and get on with it and stop moaning. So <laughs> I think it was kind of that, really, quite honestly. It sort of shamed me into action, really. 
and just felt like uh, time just to get on. And I think as a filmmaker, I'm always looking for what I call clues. And I feel those clues are often not necessarily factual, but emotional. And it felt like this thing about the objects was a clue. And it felt like that felt like it was very much part of my life. The fact that everything I do is so embedded in the all world. And then it felt like um, the financial thing also felt like a big clue because it felt like we weren't really looking. I mean, obviously, there, there's, some, there's some more and more campaigns around that, but it felt like we're not really looking at that enough. Um, so I think through those clues, gradually the film comes together. And one of the biggest challenges was that we couldn't get in the rigs. We couldn't. At, uh, for a long time, we didn't think we'd be able to speak to anyone from the oil industry. Um, but eventually, they agreed to, to, to speak to us. So I think when we felt that we had that voice, actually it allowed us to then have the activists even stronger. So we needed that voice in order to have the other, the other side really have its strength. If we hadn't had that voice, Whatever the other side said, would have, we would have been accused of just um, speaking to an echo chamber. Mm. So it was really important that we Im embedded the, 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 the power structure within the film itself. And um, yeah, different people have different opinions about that, but it, it, it felt a very important thing. Um, I'm sure I've got other things to say, but maybe you want to come in there, Lindsay. Yeah. So, I, I mean, I really enjoyed, like you say, that kind of visual motif that you had recurring through the film of sh sort of showing all of these products and these everyday items. I thought it was a really nice kind of like grounding thing and allowed us to personally connect. I thought this thing about having this, um, you said something to me a, a while ago about um, you wouldn't normally see these people in the same room having this conversation. And in a way, you were creating this, com you were forcing the conversation to happen <laughs> in front of us. And I thought that was really powerful, a powerful device. It's so fragmented and yet, you know, it's everybody's future. We have to talk about it together. And we have to bring these different voices actually into a room together. So I thought, well, that's what film can do. We can actually do that. I mean, we're living through such an exceptional period of history and, you know, we need to all get on board to find a solution and the solution is urgent, uh, urgently needed as we all know. So confronting the oil industry with those questions felt really important. And um, the, there are things that they say that maybe go unchallenged in wider society, such as this question of net zero, which you know they will constantly say, but we're aiming for net zero. And we are, um, you know, working in solutions to be carbon neutral. And it felt like also in COP that went largely unchallenged. And, you know, the whole question of how oil came out of, you know, how oil was so silent and how COP actually didn't really confront the whole oil industry was something that we wanted to, to really look at post COP too. So all of these questions were really important. And we meet um, James in the film as well, who we see drawing this fabulous map and, and being sort of a narrator, um, taking us, you know, holding our hand in a way through this complicated narrative. And um, uh, Terry said something, <laughs> has said something to me before that made me laugh, which was that I've been buried under newspapers for many years, <laughs> which you have, you've been buried under newspapers for many years as a, as a newspaper journalist. And I wondered um, what you thought about the, um, sort of having your you know, deep understanding of this subject and many years of journalism inspiring films and working in other forms, how that feels for you as a print journalist to, um, to reach audiences in different forms? Would it be better if I stood up? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, and maybe I'll, I'll stand here so you don't feel I'm putting my back to you. <laughs> um, yeah, so, so it was, it was a, an extraordinary experience on many different levels and enormously rewarding. Um, yeah, I mean, I was, I worked at the Journal of uh, the Guardian for 20 years, um, latterly as the energy editor, I spent a lot of time um, in, as a reporter, effectively, a uh, commentator, but mainly a reporter. And so I spent a lot of time with oil companies. I had to 
um, have their trust that I could be in the room with them as well as represent the interests of the public, um, energy workers and um, environmentalists, say. And so that's, that's a kind of very technocratic job. It's very um, demanding. And five years ago, I thought, actually, I can't cope with this anymore. I need to sort of step back a bit. And, um, and so I left. And I've since then um, embarked on the book, which um, we talked about or mentioned here, Crew Britannia. And I've got, I do some journalism, but I'm mainly an activist, really. Um, and I wake up every morning trying to think how I can use my time, my skills, to change this situation um, around the climate crisis, which undoubtedly is the most um, important issue that we all face. And it's got to go along with social justice, absolutely vital that those two things go together, environmentalism and social justice. Um, but one of the things I realized, having been out of the sort of hothouse of um, daily journalism after so long, literally kind of 30 years, um, was that I, I, I couldn't see the wood for the trees. I mean, I could do my job. I could do what The Guardian wanted. I felt I was playing a role. But I hadn't got, I'd kind of left behind my kind of um, intellectual me and actually my emotional me as well. And I needed to reconnect with that. And I've done that over the last five years. I'm sorry, this is a very long-winded way of getting to um, why it was important to work with Emma um, on the film. But that kind of opening up allowed me to realize the incredible importance of... Um, of radio, blogcasts, um, and particularly audiovisual and film. And what was wonderful about talking to Emma was that, that Emma doesn't come from <laughs> a lifetime of talking to oil companies and talking to environmentalists. And so it was very refreshing um, to get her perspective. And I think that's what we, as journalists, we tend to just talk to other journalists or talk to spokesmen or talk to politicians or talk to industry figures. And we, we get out, we've been far removed due to financial cuts away from talking to the public in a lot of cases. And journalists are, are stuck inside the M25. It's really, really damaging. Um, I could go on, but you probably don't want me to. I think this thing that you say about like this, um, this interest in collaboration and there being a kind of cross-pollination between these disciplines and all of our different approaches to how we address these, these issues and these stories, I think is really interesting. So thank you very much for, I really appreciate hearing that. And I think it's really brave for, um, for, for all of us in our own disciplines to approach other experts or people in other, working in other ways to find new and compelling ways to tell stories that we care about. Um, I wanted to show, we have a nice clip of the black cop that I thought would be really cool to show because I think this, just continuing on with this um, talking about form and themes and how we all get to t engage audiences in the stories that we care about, I'd love to talk more about that. Shall we play the black cop clip? Um, yeah, thank you. So in sort of, you know, quite prosaic terms creatively, we see the sort of different ingredients, the ele like creative elements that make up that film. So there's this really intimate um, uh, conversation between you and G where we, we meet him and, and we have his testimony. There's this impressionistic, beautifully like realized um, dramatic reconstruction. And that there's a use of archive. And I wondered if you could talk a bit more about the archive. Yeah, um, I think with the, the framing of the master interview, I really wanted to um, bring audiences into my friendship with him and just like how we've sat across dinners over the years, just talking about everything and how conversations can go anywhere and just like that level of intimacy, just eye to eye and sharing. Um, so that was really important to the film. And just like you said, like the, the recon, just because there's a lot of um, his story that is so visual, and it's a retrospective, but I wanted it to feel immediate for audiences. Um, and so, yeah, we lent into Recon to kind of 
do that. So it felt present tense um, and, yeah, and immediate. But, yeah, the archive was a really interesting experience. Like, I, I was leaning into his personal and subjective experiences, but obviously nothing happens in isolation, so trying to kind of place it in context. Um, and there's a lot of... Uh, like big themes that are explored in the film from him being like a, a child who was in care. Um, obviously race and racism, self-hatred, policing, him being a, a LGBTQ plus person, um, just trying to bring everything together and use an archive to, to bring that to life. Um, and so it was really trying to place his, his experience in context, but within that and with going through the archive, I became really just aware of how stories have been told about marginalized communities um, and how things went unchecked uh, uh, throughout it. You know, there's, there's two parts um, of the film where I'm kind of trying to give a nod to that, that I'm using archive to place the story in context, but also trying to acknowledge that there's a limitation of the archive as well. Um, so at the beginning, when we're talking about him being a child um, of the farming experience, and for people who don't know, um, it was a practice mainly um, from people of West African descent where uh, they would place their kids in the care of white people for a number of years while they get established. Maybe they were in education or they were looking for a job or trying to find housing. And there was like a level of kudos that, that came with that, that they felt came with that, like having your child raised by a British white family. Um, and to do that, we used archive and, and yeah, there, there, there's a piece in it where there's a reporter who is standing next to a three month old baby and he, he's introducing her. And he says, um, yeah, like why she's here and what problems uh, colored children beset their white foster parents, I'm, I'm here to find out. And I thought it was just really interesting the framing of that, that this three month old baby is presenting problems by being um, a person of color and that he said that just so casually and loads of people would have watched that and been involved in putting that out and it was presented as fact, you know, and we trust these platforms and we trust the reporters and the journalists to present us with facts. And if you're watching it without a critical eye, it can feed into your narrative of what this community is and the problems that we supposedly possess on white people. Um, so that was very interesting. And then um, separately in the film, when we're exploring, yeah, his connection to being a gay man um, throughout his life, but particularly in the 80s and 90s, um, against the back set of the backdrop of HIV. And you have a reporter saying that HIV has not put a stop to the promiscuous lifestyle of the homosexual. And again, it's like, that's not a fact, like that they didn't go out and do a report and have a survey and ask homosexuals versus non-homosexuals how promiscuous they are and like present a report. He just said it like it was factual, you know? Um, it was worrying, it's, it, it's worrying. And, and it's a present tense conversation when we think about the reporting of the war in Ukraine and how language is used around that, like these are blonde haired, blue eyed people and this, you know, this, these aren't, um, it's not a developing country. And so just what that implies about people who aren't blonde haired, blue eyed, just how, how things are framed and go un, unchecked. I was, I was having a conversation with that while making the film and mm. yeah, it was quite an interesting experience. I think that, yeah, that's really fascinating to hear you, like, speak about that kind of implicit conversation that the film is having with journalism and, like, its role, its responsibilities, um, and also, like, the opportunity that we have as, like, creative filmmakers to really get into something and debunk some of that or challenge some of that or, you know, or point some of that out. Um, uh, I am conscious of time, and, like, I'd love to leave time for um, any questions that you might have, but I wondered, and maybe this is just because I'm very interested in, the, in these things, if anyone had any, like, if anyone here had any, like, top tips <laughs> that they would like to um, shout out to other, to filmmakers or, um, or journalists, or anything that you particularly love, either in this program or, you know, there's stuff on your platforms that you, films that you really like, that you think would, ha like, you'd like to point people to, that sort of articulate what you love or are inspired by, like, you know, and speak to this relationship between creative um, documentary and journalism. Anyways, bombshell. We <laughs> I was just thinking about what's present here is the, the work of the Ukrainian film collective Babylon 13. 13 yeah. 
and they've made a film called One Day in Ukraine. And I think we, we were talking, Yvonne and I, just as we were waiting about how we respond quickly and creatively. And mm -hmm. they have that challenge constantly just now. Um, so that, that was a really interesting film to catch and to, to hear them talk. That's a really nice idea, yeah. And I think there's a Ukrainian delegation as well. So anyone with industry can kind of meet some Ukrainian filmmakers who are here um, working in all sorts of streams from quite reactive things to longer form really um, artistic approaches to storytelling as well. So anyone else want a shout out or do we want some more time to think about our shout outs before we take some questions? I would just start, shout out to our entire platform. Yeah, <laughs> just me too. I think it's it. great. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, I think earlier I mentioned a ship from Guantanamo. Yeah. That's a great example. But I think, on I think all of our films they're very different. But there's kind of a through line. But I think they all kind of embrace the you know the individuality of the filmmaker really shines through every film. Mm -hmm. The cr creativity in which they approach their topic, but also then I think when what you're saying about how how you know communities have been pathologized by mediums that people have trusted like journalism and I think what's really powerful about my, about our films is that these filmmakers as individuals come from such disparate communities around the world and they are then empowered to mm -hmm. tell their story and have it on the New York Times which I find powerful because I think with the New York I think with the Times you know things be things become part of the archive so you know years from now someone will look up you know, a film, or they, may, they might look up something on the Times, and our film is part of that conversation, whether yeah. it's something about race or class or gender or whatnot, the films and the filmmaker's point of view becomes part of that archive of like, this is what the New York Times presented. So I, I think that's really powerful. So watch it all. Yeah, I do, yeah, I also watch it all and love it. I also love your newsletter, how you like, you know, um, speak to the issues around the films or give some insight into like the filmmaker's perspective. I think that's really cool. And also avid reader of Charlotte's newsletter, Field Division, <laughs> um, <laughs> like creating conversations around the films too. Um, yeah, that's well worth looking at. I can give some shout outs too if that helps. One, my, my big one is watch Black Cop if you haven't seen it. It's such an exceptional film and I feel bad I didn't get to meet Cherish because I love the film so much. So um, there's that. Um, and Emma, I can't wait to see your film too. So I'm so excited about that. And then we have we have to, we have a film playing today right after this panel. We have Nothing Compares, um, which is the Sinead O'Connor film. If you haven't seen it, I implore you to see it, especially right now. You know, Sinead was somebody who was talking about women's rights, abortion rights, um, the role of Christianity in the church in women's lives. So if you haven't seen it, it's right after this panel. Um, and then we also have a film called Caring for Catherine, which is a really good example of using creativity um, to look at disability and family, and then Family Statement, which is one of our very political films, which is about the Sackler family. Um, and it's kind of like watching the succession, like family group chat on screen. Yeah. So if that <laughs> floats your boat, it's really quite incredible how the filmmakers found this Sackler family group chat. Um, so they're, they're on three at the festival. Yeah, I love those. And I saw the, um, the Family Statement was it yesterday? Time has morphed for me. But anyway, it's, yeah, it's so brilliant. It's a surprising way into like a subject that, you know, the opioid crisis, as journalists were engage, engaging with, but like filmmakers have this incredible way of giving us a surprising way into a story that we thought we knew. So I love, yeah, that film too. Um, awesome stuff to be looking at, everyone. Did you have any? <laughs> <laughs> I haven't seen as enough films while I've been here, but... Um, this is National Wake Up, it was really brilliant. And that is about um, a band uh, that existed during a, a apartheid in South Africa. And it was just, it had black people and white people in it and they lived together, which was illegal at the time. And it tells the story of, you know, just what that time was like, but also has heart and emotion and a brilliant soundtrack as well. So um, oh. yeah, I thought that was great. Yeah, mm. awesome. Um, did anyone have any questions they wanna, oh, very fast hand. One thing that I loved of the examples that you're bringing up is how you were able to bring people from opposite sides of the line, um, you know, like in the oil film, having activists, but also people. In, and I think that's so difficult, especially in the age of pol polarity that we live in all the time. Also being able to showcase someone that's not just a victim, but a perpetrator and, and being able to show that part of themselves. So the question is, um, what was the tipping point to actually persuade people that might have been completely opposite in view to some of the other people you were gonna interview in your film or someone that was gonna show a part of themselves that was not perhaps the nicest, what was the tipping point to be able to convince them to be a part of the conversation? 
Yeah, I think it's a really good question, and I'm sure Sonia, as the producer, will have something to say that it, it was a whole team of us that tried to convince them. So, in a way, the research team would, because we had to make this quite quickly, so the research team would go in first, and then they'd arrange a conversation with me. And I think I just tried to understand their perspective in that conversation. So I think I tried to imagine what it was to be them and um, spoke to them from that perspective. So tried to not judge and tried to just understand. And I think they felt, or the, the feeling that I got was that they were so relieved that they began thanking me, which I felt a bit guilty about. Um, <laughs> And I kept saying, but you do know, I mean, I was really clear, I kept saying, you do know, people are going to say completely the opposite of what you're going to say. And they're like, yes, but we still trust you. So how people trust you is a really interesting question. And even after seeing it, BP thanked us. It's kind of crazy. You know? <laughs> Which really surprised us. <laughs> so I'm not quite sure why uh, or what that's about, but I think they wanted to be part of a complex argument and not just be seen as one thing. Um, and they are part of a complex argument in this film, but there's no doubt that, you know, the power base that they hold is criticised in the film. So I think, um, I don't know, I, I think it, they, maybe they have a different perspective on it now when they see the reaction that the film has. But um, they were keen to have a voice. Shell thought they were going to have a voice and you know they were keen on it at a certain point and then I think when the whole question of you know the Campbell coming and going and various other projects they had coming and going they basically just withdrew completely. Yeah but they have a job just to say they also have a duty to speak like the oil and gas UK actually have a duty to speak so it's partly that. Um. Yeah, I was fortunate that I didn't have to convince him. Like, he wanted to share his story and understood the importance of it, like, on, on many levels. And the hope was that, you know, by sharing his story, he would encourage other people to go on their own journeys and do their own kind of, like, inner work. And, um, yeah, as a black person that's had interactions with the police and friends and family and people close to me have had, you know, interactions with the police, um, yeah, it was important to kind of have that perspective represented and and it's a rare he speaks with such like piercing honesty and you rarely hear a police officer or a former police officer say like i have perpetrated racism and this is why and this is how kind of thing um so i'm fortunate that he was ready to share his story but also the idea of having rolling consent was really important um and just letting him know that he can share things in the interview and change his mind afterwards and he did um uh, change his mind on sharing some things as well and he watched the film before picture lock and everything like that so there was like an ongoing dialogue about um, yeah his involvement in the film um, but fortunately I didn't have to convince him yeah. hi thanks everyone it's a really interesting conversation um, I wanted to ask a little bit more and I suppose the question could be for anyone but perhaps particularly um, uh, Lindsay and Emma, maybe. Sorry, not Emma, Charlotte. Um, it's about, again, this relationship between um, uh, kind of factual reporting through journalism meets more creative forms. And so kind of talking to what Yvonne was talking about at um, NYT Opdocs, they have a very um, rigorous fact-checking process. Um, is something like that in place, or is it more of an individual conversation depending on the film? I'm just wondering what you look for as you know commissioners and, and behind the scenes on these things when you're approaching new films and how you negotiate that relationship thank you um charlotte did you want to go first um, on that um, yeah i think i was i, I think if, what yvonne was saying was so important and i think often filmmakers kind of can see that fact checking process as like oh my god it's such a huge thing because it is i mean it takes a lot of time it takes a lot more time than everyone thinks um it can be really empowering though i think and especially when you tie in 
the fact checking process with a legal process. And whenever we head filmmakers into that, I think it can be really daunting because you kind of feel like, oh my God, I'm having to tweet my film. And, but it strengthens the film in a way that, you know, Family Statement is a really good example of this. Like, you know, we could have easily gotten sued by the Sacklers. Um, so you have to make sure the filmmakers aren't at risk for that. And so you have to be able to balance how do we put out very, very bold work and also protect the filmmakers from, for, to be able to make that kind of work. And that is where fact checking legal comes in. Because if you can stand behind everything, in a journalistic context, it, you know, people can still sue you. I think people forget that is even if you can do fair use, even if you have a legal review, they can still sue you um, and they can just, you know, make your life miserable. But what you try and do is to take out any level of doubt um, that you can on your end so that you can really stand behind it. So it isn't worth them suing it. That, that's kind of always the, the, the line that we're all taking here. Um, and I think, you know, for us, even the most creative films we have all go through that process on our shorts. Our, our features, we don't put in the kind of journalistic context so much. Um, that's kind of an independent process, but because we are the distributor in the same way of, of Docs and The Guardian, like we also have to stand behind it too. Um, and it is, you know, the last thing you ever want is something to be wrong because it's it's bad for people involved in the film. It's bad for the filmmakers, it's bad for us just because you want to be able to stand behind the work. and. A lot of our filmmakers end up really liking the process because it makes them think in different ways and make tweaks and changes. And so when the film goes out, they feel very protected. And so I think it's an incredibly vital process. But I mean, even the most creative of our films goes through it. Yeah, I mean, I echo what both of um, uh, Yvonne and Charlotte have said that, like, you know, we're really, um, we feel the sort of response, like the responsibilities ar around, um, you know, the legal work that we have to do for the films. And we do, you know, operate within um, the framework of our editorial, like The Guardian has like an editorial code, so we operate within that framework. Um, from our point of view, we come on projects at any stage, from late um, development through production and post-production. Um, so in that sense, I'm sort of addressing each project on a case-by-case -case basis. So within those kind of frameworks, there will be work that we do with filmmakers at each stage. I think consent is a really big thing, and we think really deeply about um, relationships of trust with contributors and filmmakers, how that works. Um, and then, yes, we're stress testing the, uh, you know, we're, broad, we're operating broadly within the realms of explanatory journalism, so we, we have to stress test all the decisions that are made at every stage. And I find, like, sometimes it's hardest to engage with work when you're right the way down, like, towards picture lock in post-production, because so many of decisions will have been made before then that will have impacted how you're telling stories. So in a way, I personally have found films that we're in early on easier to go on that journey with the filmmaker and manage the risk around legal repercussions, um, uh, yeah, and the relationship to truth. Any other questions? I think there's a hand over here. And there's another hand in the aisle. Hi guys, yeah, uh, thank you so much for that talk. It was really insightful, I thought. Uh, two things in particular, the thing Yvonne mentioned about making sure the stories are like character driven and creating that human element to the current affairs. I think that's something I definitely need to remember and Emma talking about making sure your film's not an echo chamber. That's something like I need to remember too. But as um, a very sort of new fr uh, filmmaker, I have a very tough internal dialogue where something I always worry about is are people just going to watch this like 15 minute short I'm making and, and just forget about it as soon as they finish watching it and it's not going to have an impact? I was just wondering if the other panelists, whether you're a filmmaker or um, funding, supporting films, whether you've ever shared that same sentiment and whether you have any words of guidance off the back of it. I'll take that first. I'm, I can jump in. Yeah. Um, I, I would take the pressure off yourself. I think. Think about it more as it's a visual medium. So rather than thinking about how an audience member reacts, you need to tell the story in the way that matters to you and hope that you find that audience member that sees that or that you provoke something in them because you cannot control how an audience member is going to react to your film or not. And you kind of get yourself in knots trying to, trying to do that. Um, I think it really is about telling something in a way that, you know, a filmmaker's perspective is really important. I think we have to kind of, even in a journalistic framework, we have to think there's always a perspective. So as much as we're trying to, I mean, I kind of land more on factual than truth when it comes to 
you know, the truthiness of it all, because there's always a perspective. And also a lot of filmmakers are trying to say something. And I think, it, you know, I was thinking when Cherish was talking about working with archive, a lot of filmmakers are reimagining history and, and, and recontextualizing is a better word of history. And so we're re-examining re what truth is in a different lens from knowing more and having bigger voices and better ways of saying things. So um, perspective is really, really important. And so I would, I would, as a filmmaker, just always think, what is your perspective? What are you trying to say? And, and the best and kind of most creative way to approach it too. Um, and even with, you know, the character element too is I think think about that extra layer too because we get we get sent a lot of films that are kind of here is a portrait of someone and my question is always like where's the and right is that you need the extra pieces of of what what whatever they're doing or who they are what are you trying to say beyond just that person what is that person's story going to speak to um I think a lot of filmmakers kind of miss that bit um yeah that's otherwise I've gone for ages yeah. thank you oh yeah I think one thing as a filmmaker that I find is that the filmmaking process exhausts me so much that I don't have energy to, to really get the film out there afterwards. So I guess my top tip is get a really good team to help you and don't put that responsibility on yourself to do that. I mean, I'm, I'm really lucky that I work with a brilliant producer, Sonia, um, who, who helps that process and helps it become a whole other thing. But she also has her collaborators. And I know it's hard when you don't have any money, but if the subject is something you're passionate about. It's amazing how people will help you. It's almost like it has its own energy then. But don't rely just on your energy because it's a, it's a finite source. Um, I think there's a, a question in the aisle here and then I'll come to you. My, my question is for Cherish. Um, what a beautiful way to rip the brand off with the Black Cop film. I think it's amazing, the conversation of swap and search, racism, LGBT, done in the most beautiful and delicate way. I know you must be tired, but I'm really curious to know where you're going next, because I'm excited. <laughs> <laughs> um, thanks, Nicole. Um, uh, yeah, I'm developing things at the moment, actually. And yeah, just trying to start the whole process again and trying to get new projects off the ground. Um, and uh, I'm interested in exploring the difficult subjects, but I'm also interested in things that are more like lighthearted. Like it is really exhausting making the, yeah, exploring the difficult subjects, especially when it's so close to home. So um, yeah, that's what's next to me, just exploring things that are, you know, maybe a film about puppies, you never know. So. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, so this is a self-critical question. I make historical documentaries, and the two things that worry me, it's a kind of history cliche that the plural of anecdotes is not data. And in a big complex subject, you can find nearly anybody to say nearly anything, and yet, of course, people's anecdotes is what's viewable. So you end up, you know, there's, there's a kind of worry there that you've ended up not really proving your, your point. And the second worry I have is you, you've used the word conversation a lot, and we all want our films to start conversation. But actually, uh, documentaries are not very spontaneous. They, you know, they take a long time to put together. They're actually one-way communication to the viewer. And then maybe some conversation takes place in some space you may or may not see, you certainly don't control, you can't really contribute to. So as, an, as a mechanism for sort of moving forward knowledge, you know, those are the two things that worry me. You know, as somebody who makes films and is trying to do all the things that you are talking about and I'd be grateful for your advice on both. Is that, um, shall, is that, shall I take some of that? Um, I think the thing, so the reason conversation really interests me is because because I think that conversations are collaborative, you know, it takes more than one person to have that and I think that's fundamentally the dynamic that underlies filmmaking and also viewing films. So I think we have like collective experiences like we do have here, and I think there's power in that. But I think that there's as well power in the making of the films. I'm also quite interested in like how you do that with co-creation um, and the sort of values and practices around that. So I think that I personally like I really believe <laughs> in the conversations that happen at every stage from the making through to the like delivery. And then also when films leave our realm of like control and power and go off out into the world as they do, and like you say are found like on the internet by people 10 years later looking on YouTube or whatever, like them engaging with those films in, 
on their own laptops in the comfort of their homes or in collective experiences or then chatting down the pub about those. I think that's all part, those conversations, even when they're really small ones, I think that's like where the power is. So I, I don't know, that's what I'd say about that. I don't know if anyone else has anything to add on that. Add to that, um, I used to work at POV, which is a long form documentary series on PBS. And when the show premiered on PBS in the 80s, at the end of each broadcast, they would have a number where people could call in and like just, just leave voicemails that were listened to by PBS or the staff. And, and like I thought, learning about that when I was working there, I found that so powerful because in these voicemails, people, I mean, they're talking to themselves. Like they're not talking to anybody, but, the, but what they were saying on the voicemails about like, you know, like PBS broadcasted Marlon Riggs films, you know, very famously, and people were calling in talking about like seeing, you know, seeing a black gay man filmmaker being a black gay person in America or whatnot and seeing that on screen and the conversation and engagement they both were having with themselves or in, and, and with their community because of films like that were being broadcasted, I think to me is what's really powerful and about the fact that, you know, once the film is broadcasted, whether on broad, you know, TV, whatever, online, whatnot, you know, like you said, it's open to anybody, but I think the fact that all these films kind of add up to this, like it's because of Marlon Riggs that like I'm able to do what I, I can do. And if he didn't make that film and it was broadcasted to everyone, like what wouldn't have happened if that wasn't broadcasted? So I think there's power. I think there's a lot of power in films, even if as filmmakers you may think like, oh, well, it's out there, it's gone, bye. Oh. Yeah, sorry, um, Cherish, you go, then Char Charlotte, you jump in. Um, yeah, just to add to that, like it was interesting, just the whole thing about, yeah, when the film goes out, you have no control about over like where it goes and who it connects with and how um, after the film, sometimes after the film goes out, it can have a relevance that it maybe didn't have before. Um, and yeah, a few weeks after the Black Cop came out, the IOPC report was published and, you know, where the information about obviously the WhatsApp group and the Charing Cross station was shared and it gave the film a different um, context or a different level of validity in a way and then you have the contributor having a conversation on Good Morning Britain about the film and his experiences and it's just the thing of like we don't necessarily know where the film will go and who it will impact and when it will become relevant if it will become relevant but it's by making the work it makes it possible for people to connect with it and potentially have those conversations um, afterwards yeah. yeah and Charlotte you had something to add yeah, I think I think it's hard for filmmakers, obviously, because you put something out in the world and then you kind of don't always get that direct feedback. And I, but I think we, we often miss the kind of cultural impact that the films have. I mean, I think if you if you think about an album re being released in music, the, it kind of affects people around the world when they hear it, but the artists may not directly know that. And I think filmmakers need to kind of remember that there are going to be a lot of people who are probably changed and who, who their thinking has been changed by just purely watching it. And for me, that's incredibly powerful. And I think you know, we measure impact a lot and it's really hard for filmmakers to kind of have those metrics that we have to kind of determine. But that's, for me, the cultural change and people just watch it and kind of, you know, I know that art has fundamentally changed. It's this kind of belief that visible to us, which is hard, but it really does. And I, I just wanted to answer the question too about the kind of, you can have anybody talking about anything. Um, I think it's a really interesting conversation I think we're about to have a big conversation in our field about subjects and consent and and kind of who is speaking on camera and how they're contextualized and I think it's a conversation we've been needing to have for a very long time um but I do think you know, the film we have to kind of people are trusting the filmmakers lens of who they're they're putting on screen and that's the big challenge um, I think the connection Your just... Enough. Oh. Knowing respect to me too. oh, sorry. I think the connection started to go a bit wonky there, but I think we got, um, I think we got some of the, um, the gist of that around like uh, trust and consent and the complicated question of impact, which is a, which is a big old can of worms. Um, do we have time for another couple of questions? I think we've got one over here. Do we not? What is the time? Oh, right. I think we've got five minutes over. Okay, so if anyone needs to scoot out because you're going through a thing, feel free. But um, I think there was a uh, We'll take one more question. Oh, is everyone going? Maybe everyone's <laughs> going. Oh, Sinead O'Connor. Okay, everyone run. We are go we're all around at drinks and stuff a lot of the time. So thank you for the conversation.